So, hello, my name is Sandra Wasser, and as you can tell by the title, this is not my result at all. However, any errors are mine and definitely not Birkhoff's. <laughs> so, as you can probably tell by the black and white picture, this is not a recent result either. It was the paper that everyone refers to as uh, the first time is published in 1935 and uh, at the time uh, mathematician George David Birkhoff was about 51 when his son uh, Garrett Birkhoff uh, published this paper. Yeah, so not only are there more than one uh, mathematician's name, Birkhoff, uh, Garrett also wrote extensively on algebra and lattices and has a lot of theorems. But uh, the one I mean to talk about is very easy to state. It's uh, equational classes are varieties. And uh, well, as it happens in uh, the field of uh, universal algebra, it's more tricky to understand. <laughs> so universal algebra de describes general ideas behind specific algebraic structures like groups or lattices. Um, so how do how do we define algebra? We start with a set, and then we take uh, in some n elements and map them to one other element and call this an operation. I will probably call it a function as well by accident. Uh, and we want these we want more of these operations. We want the whole set of them. So we have a set of operations, now we want to index this set. And uh, the way we do this is we define a type. Uh, so we have these function si functional symbols and we uh, assign an, this n to, to those symbols. So now we have uh, operations with, with arity of uh, which is an integer. So that's our algebra. We have a set of elements, we have a set of operations, and uh, uh, yeah, talking about the operations, if we take no elements and map them to something, that is a constant, and we will denote the set of constants F0. And uh, in currently explored algebras, these are the FTs of, of uh, operations that are used. <laughs> Apparently, no higher that that's interesting. Um, so, uh, okay, we have an algebra now, and well, maybe more of them. Uh, and they have these operations of some type, and we want to f find some more algebras like that. Or, or some, how do we do that? We do that by constructing them using direct products, subalgebras, and homomorphisms. What are those? Well, let's start with direct products. So we have all these algebras, and we take their underlying sets. So, and we take the Descartes product of these underlying sets. But the catch is that we have maybe infinitely many of these algebras, and that's why we write it like a function of the indexes this uh, deck product, or the, the, for sets, it's, uh, yeah, so it's also direct product. And once we have this set, we want to define the, our functions which we have, and we do that also component-wise, uh, taking for each index, like for our new algebra, the function, Will on on this index will give the result such that uh, it is this operation from the appropriately indexed algebra and used on the appropriately indexed elements. Okay, we also have subalgebras. Uh, in subalgebras, we take the exist the a subset of the existing set and make sure that the operations that were previously, that the new operations work correctly on the new subset. 
So they are restrictions of the original operations. Next, we have homomorphism. So for the previous two, the elements in the new set were basically the same elements as the starting one. Just maybe fewer or maybe like listed more of them. But homomorphisms let us take a completely new set and uh, we just have to make sure that the operations have worked the same way as previously. How do we make sure of that? By making them obey this equation. So what this equation means, we, we have our previous set and uh, we had the operation which mapped some elements to a new element and then we take the homomorphic image to our new set and it goes to some element. This element has to be the same if we took this element that we mapped took their homomorphic image uh, on the new set and that it took this new operation and it mapped to this new element. To, to, and it turns out that this element is the same as it was top. Now that we have all these things, we have the variety, which is the second part of it. Um, yeah, so if we have our class of algebras and it is closed under subalgebras, homomorphic images, and direct products, it is called a variety. It is maybe worth noting, like Tarski did some 10 years later, uh, we will call uh, the smallest variety containing our class of algebras K a variety generated by K. Okay, and if we take our class of algebras and we take all the products of these algebras, take all the subalgebras of that, and take all the homomorphic images of that, it is the variety generated by K. That's, yeah. Uh, so, I have some grasp of the second part of this theorem. So, what about the equational classes? Well, for that, we need terms. So what are terms? How do we make terms? <laughs> well, we take, oh, uh, and uh, we want those terms to be of type F also. Uh, so we want that we take some variables and put them in a, this is our set of terms. Then we add our constants to them, this F is zero. So this is our set of terms and then we do it inductively. We, uh, we say that, uh, okay, we have some n terms already, and we have this n uh, operation. Well, okay, so this operation working on these terms is also in our set of terms. And that way we build up a set of terms. And uh, we will also write term as p with x's so that we know what variables go into this uh, term. Uh, we also want to evaluate our terms and what does it, when, for that we need to be in a specific algebra A and when we have a specific algebra then the way we evaluate these terms is again in two steps. In the first case, when the term is just a variable, then we take some list of elements from our underlying set and just take the, uh, up the, the correct element and say this is our, the value of our term. And uh, in the other case, when our uh, term is of the form some function of some terms, in this case, k are a function with k terms. Then we take this algebra's version of the corresponding function and we evaluate these terms in this algebra as before <laughs> or as currently, well, again deductively, and uh, perform this function on, on, on these term values. Okay, now that we know how to evaluate terms, 
we can get to identities. Identities are just uh, expressions of the form one term equals another term. And uh, so what we are interested in is for our class of algebras to satisfy a set of identities sigma. Well, when does that happen? When uh, our set of identities foo, our set of algebras, uh, satisfies each identity in the set. Okay, when, when, when does a whole set of algebras satisfy an identity? When each algebra in the set of, in the class of algebras satisfies set identity. Okay, when does an algebra satisfy an identity? Well, when we put the particular, when we evaluate these terms for the algebra and they correspond. All right, and so now that's that's that brings us to our equational class. So uh, when we have a sigma set of identities of type f, and uh, and uh, and uh, a class k which satisfies these identities, then we call this class of uh, algebras an equational class. So that's my... Uh, now I understand what Birkhoff theorems says. <laughs> it's when I have my <laughs> class of algebras of some of the same type and it satisfies some set of identities, then it is also uh, close to products, subalgebras, and homomorphic images. So I don't think I have time to explain. Yes, I have time. Thank you. More question? Did you also have a chance to take a look at the proof? Yes, I still have to learn some tricky words <laughs> to understand the proof. So if I have to guess, it's, it's either the proof is five lines long or five pages long. So which case? I think both. Because it's like, lamb must go for five pages and the proof is, oh, then it just follows from this lamb and that lamb. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, oh. Maybe to understand the proof and explain it in uh, algebra seminars in the future. These are for algebra seminars. <laughs>